Yes, yes, we are live again. We are back for another edition of the Commissioner's Corner. Yo, people, I am your host for the most, NK, aka the man of the hour, too sweet to be sour. And of course, I am always joined by my lovely co host, you know, the UK's number one leading black pro wrestling historian. I call him the pro wrestling encyclopedia. Knowledge, how you doing, sir? You called me lovely, by the way, but that's okay. I'll, um, <laughs> your lovely co host. You know? I feel like I should be spinning letters around, you know. <laughs> um, Do you want a more gruff pro wrestling um, 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 intro? No, it's good. It's good. I'm I said <laughs> lovely today. I don't, I don't mind. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I've had a busy day, so I feel a bit amped. <laughs> you mm-hmm. know? But of course, we are not alone. We are joined by a very, very, very special guest. Someone who I've wanted to chop it up about Graps for a long time. Woman who needs no introduction. You know, you probably see the tweeting, interviewing some of your favorite wrestlers. We got Miss Lyric in the building. How are you doing? Hi, really happy to be here. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Already, already you're receiving <laughs> love. Already, look at that. The show's just started. Yeah, yeah. Make sure everyone in the comment section, make sure you show lyrics some love. Make sure right. you definitely follow her page. Tell the people what you got going on before we get in, um, before we get into it. Tell the people where they can find you, what, what you got going on. Um, you can find me at Lyric Wrestling on Twitter and Instagram. You can subscribe to my YouTube, uh, my first and last name, Lyric Swinton. So yeah, that's about it. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yep, we're doing well. Thank you for asking, bro. But yeah, man, listen, it's been a huge week in wrestling. It's been, you know, a week of, pun intended, big business for AEW. We had, you know, the worst kept secret in pro wrestling. Mercedes Monet is officially all elite. And before, you know, we break down the numbers, the statistics, the gate, let's just talk as fans for, for the beginning. How did we feel? Lyric, how did you feel when Dynamite opened? You heard Um, the music and Mercedes debuted. It was special. It was just really special. Um, I followed her career since the NXT days. And so she was somebody who, you know, really stoked my love for wrestling, like getting me back into it in high school um, and like keeping me involved in it. Like I always tell the story of how, when I had my first job, I used to, um, I didn't have a bank account, so I would go cash the checks and like go to Walmart and buy the gift cards for WWE Network three months at a time to, to be able to watch NXT just because like I was obsessed with her. And when I did get a bank account, first thing I did was order a legit boss t-shirt. And so, yeah, she's always been so special to me and like seeing her and obviously the American promotion that one I watch most, but also just just watching her journey and seeing the big ovation she got from you know her home crowd um it was great to see her on tv again it was just it was super special i was just so excited you can't say any anything but you know positive things about it 100 percent, 100 percent. knowledge how did you feel when you know it was you saw mercedes you know hit the aw stage for the first time i was um You know what? I will say this. I never really followed. I don't want to say I'd never followed her career because you know I did, but I always liked her. But I think once she left the WWE and she told them to fuck off, I really admired that about her. I, it really grew my admiration. Anyone who does that, like, and you know, this says no, I'm out of here. You know, I really think to myself, yeah, you know what? I, there's something about you, like, and she's a star. She's she's always been a star anyway. Like, you know, she, you know me. NK, when I used to be on the Rest Things podcast, I'd always talk about her numbers and how um, she was way more over than she was actually pushed. There were women in that company that were pushed way beyond her with no visible metrics mm. um, that succeeded her. Do you, her re- in any do you remember like, some notable areas like in the metrics department where Mercedes kind of shone? Like, don't have to be specific numbers, but like, was she like a good ratings show on TV? Was she good in merchandise? Yeah. She was the last run that she had there until they until they phased her out a bit, you know. Say like the 2020, 
the 2022 Royal Rumble. I think that was the last one that she did there. I remember around that time they started phasing her out a bit and they put her in that tag team. But before then, because she came back in the summer and she had that 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 autumn to winter run, she was like the number one rating straw throughout that whole period. Absolutely. You know, you, there's a guy walking around with a needle mover t-shirt, but there was no needles that he was actually moving. She was the real needle mover. You know, CM Punk was the biggest drawing wrestling at that time or whatever and then you got a guy walking around here with a needle mover shirt when really in his own company she is the actual needle mover and i don't think they ever really respected it and i don't think that you know and i don't we can get into numbers and stuff later on but yeah i was really impressed with the way it went on sorry i go on tangents lyric i was really impressed with the way it looked she came across as a star she looked happy and uh, you know the reception that she got it was definitely worth she, she deserved that I think. Yeah, um, we've got a comment from SF Productions, a black woman, now the highest paid women's wrestler. I'm so proud, I can't lie. Mm -hmm. And yeah, Mercedes yes, in her WWE tenure was always, you could even see it in you know her Twitter, where she was always advocating to be paid more. She was always advocating for, you know, not only better booking positions, but to be financially compensated. And I feel like with the genesis of AEW, like whether you are wrestling for WWE now or you're wrestling for AEW, it's created an environment where wrestlers can go out there and demand more. Because I think we always speak about like the monopoly of WWE. What does that mean? What does that mean? I think WWE being the only company for a long period of time where you can make real money meant that your negotiation negotiating options were limited. You were at the behest of whatever Vince or whoever were going to yeah. pay you. But now it's like Mercedes could go to uh, AEW and negotiate and get, you know, from what the reports are, there are no specific numbers out there, really substantial uh, money. Um, and the, the fact that, yeah, it is a black woman who's kind of at the head of the table in terms of like, well, according to reports, in terms of financial earnings in the women's division, does does warm my heart a bit because she she has been advocating to be paid as much as the Beckys and the Charlottes. And judging by the metrics that we've all laid out, she deserves it. She she did great merch, moved the needle forward. Um, and speaking of uh, moving the needle, in AEW Big Business, ticket sales. Um, it is reported that um, she sold over 9,000 tickets. For, well, Big Business sold over 9,000 tickets uh, last week, which was, um, it was which was an amazing turnout for a TV taping wow. of Dynamite, and it just shows that you know people are going to come out and see Mercedes. And according according to um some of the demo reports, the ratings reports that she did some of the best quarter hours ratings on the show. Knowledge, do you think Mercedes is going to be like a long term? draw for the company what i mean by that is a when it comes to AEW, viewership has been up and down inconsistent do you think mercedes being a mainstay on the roster is gonna help improve things like that uh i want to say i think the numbers on AEW are pretty consistent maybe mm. too consistent actually um mm. but i mean we can go into last week's you know numbers briefly but do i think she's going to be a, a difference maker i mean she they did nine and a half thousand in Boston the other day. Um, you know, last time I saw the gate was around 380,000. Uh, you know, but that's that's her debut. I mean, they beat Blood and Guts, Blood and Guts did 8,600 in the same building the year before. But, um, as far as if she's going to be a bit in case, it's, it's really hard to say. And the reason why I say that is because I'd like to think that she'd be a big mover and the fact that she's in the position she's in now. Um, I'd like to think that. You know, maybe they'd start shifting some tickets. But I told you that the thing with AW and their gates right now is it's a lot more than signing X, Y, and Z. It's a lot we've discussed this previously. It's a lot more deeper than that. But as far as do I think she's gonna move things forward? It's I hope so. But right now I don't want to say anything because you know we've we've had big wrestlers show up in AW before. We've had uh, you know we had CM Punk show up again last year or whatever, and he literally meant zero for for them on that collision show. That he meant nothing. Ed showed up uh, last winter and uh, he meant nothing as well. At the end of the day, and there's something that me and you have discussed uh, at length, these people are big stars in their home promotion. And as soon as they leave, those fans usually don't 
<laughs> they don't usually follow them in a lot of the cases because you know they can like these people when they're there, but once they leave, mm -hmm. um, did you hear that? Sorry, did you hear that? Oh, that was my dog and my he bought he, he bought uh, he, he burped right in my ear. I thought that I thought that was picked up. Uh, <laughs> that was um, yeah. A lot of the time, these people don't actually follow these their favorite wrestler to the other promotion. A lot of them see it as um, you know as leaving home, and uh, you know it gets really tribal at that point. I don't know. I'm going to have to wait and see. They've got a really good advance for this week, though, by their current standards. They're at just under 6,000 for Wednesday um, in Toronto. Is it Toronto? They're in Toronto on Wednesday, yeah, right? Yeah, they're yeah, they're in Toronto, yeah. yeah. Uh, Reg and uh, Christian in the main event, yeah. Lyric, let, let me what? ask... Let me ask you this lyric. Obviously, we saw Mercedes. Obviously, when she debuted, she cut a very impassionate, you know, promo about how she wants to be here. You know how much, um, how much you know Boston means to her. And then we saw her, you know, get involved after that tremendous main event with the women. Um, what? First of all, where do you see Mercedes being positioned in terms of? Do you see her being positioned in terms of someone who goes for the title straight away? And you know. What significance do you think she's going to have to the roster overall? Do you think her presence there is going to overall improve the booking of the women? Like, talk to me about the impact you think Mercedes is going to have on the company long term. Yeah, so I think that, in my opinion, I, I selfishly, I think as a fan, as a wrestling fan, I would love to see her booked initially, kind of like Brian Danielson was booked when he first got to AEW. Like, uh -huh. I wanted to see, you know, some open up with some really – big dream matches like you know promos are great and it was awesome but AEW is the wrestling company and so I, I think that the best way that you win folks over is uh, you know who might you know not be the believers yet is wrestling and I, I think that they're building towards that I believe that you know Serena Deeb will probably be her first opponent in AEW so I think that's one of the perfect matches to really like you know show people what she can do um, you know and I think, uh, you know, I would put the title on her, you know, fairly quickly. But the thing is, whenever you do put the title on her, expect to have it tied up for a year. And so what does that mean for the other women? At least a year, you know? So what does that mean for, you know, some of the other women in division? So I'm perfectly fine of her going, you know, starting off on a dream match tour. Like, you know, they said this is a multi-year deal. So, you know, she has more than enough time to win the title, same thing with how I kind of feel about like Osprey with, you know, I know everybody wants him to main event all in this year, but like, you know, if we're going to be doing this for a while, you, we have time to build to that. Like, you know, you don't have to do everything instantly. Um, you have these people locked down for, you know, most of your deals. Um, and as for her long-term effect on the roster, I think that she's one of those people, not just for the women's roster, she can really help AEW crossover like you know i think crossover and i don't here's the thing i don't think that is aew's job to 100 crossover they're not the sport entertainment company however you have stars like a in mercedes you have the stars like swerve the people who are doing like you know stuff outside of wrestling who can really kind of be that bridge you know for people who might not be exactly into wrestling and as you said like uh, you know i don't think that we're going to see like this massive, like, you know, ratings increase, like, anytime soon, just because at the end of the day, I think that fans nowadays, at least specifically WWE fans, are more loyal to the brand than the performers. Um, however, I do think that Mercedes fans, I, I consider Mercedes fans are a lot like Beyonce fans, like true Mercedes fans, they will follow her anywhere so if that means that i remember if anybody remembers last year january 3rd 2023 all the crew on twitter like how do i set up a new japan world account like ted somebody show me quickly how like all these people watching things they've never watched before and so although you might not have a you know it might not be millions and millions at first but long term i truly believe and as one of those people who who she has literally gotten me to like, you know, follow her throughout her career, you know, I believe that, you know, we might not see all the benefits now, but I do believe that long term, 
she's one of those people she makes believers out of anybody anybody like in her nxt career you know people didn't believe in women's wrestling and then bailey versus sasha happened you know and then suddenly now you know you see people who weren't caring about the women's wrestling advocating for women in the main event and so I do think like, you know, AEW is a hardcore wrestling audience. So I said, like, she's going to have to win them over with wrestling. But I do believe that she can absolutely do that. And, you know, I, I think that AEW is going to position her as the star, you know, like, oh, well, the, one of those top three stars, like, you know, top four stars, like, you know, I think alongside Swerve, Osprey, Okada, you know, the roster is so stacked and just, when you have women in the ring with her, it's going to elevate them just straight, uh, just straight up off of you know name recognition. And so I think that she, it, you know, and I'm glad that you brought up the needle mover comment, you know, like because she is a real, she's a real new needle mover. You know, a lot of people talk about it and you know put it on a t-shirt, but everywhere she's gone, whether it's been WWE or New Japan or AEW, check those quarter hours. You know, like people tune in to see her. Now, the only thing, the only problem currently is that if you looked at the ratings, there are some people who are tuning in to see her and turning off directly after. And so I think the challenge now is how do you keep keep people invested, you know, and how long are some of these people, and I do think some of those people are probably like going to eventually give up oh, and watching the AEW after a while. But, you know, the challenge is for those people, how do you keep them invested to watch full episodes of Dynamite, full episodes of Collision, like, you know, so I digress. Yeah, but they employ, with Mercedes, she debuted, like, in the beginning of the show, and like I said, it was because usually with the ratings, like, the lead, the first, like, hour of the show does really well because of the lead-in, but also I think it was heavily boosted by Mercedes debuting, but I think they tried to remedy that as well by having her on the end of the show, and we've gotten women's main events before on Dynamite, but it's safe to say they're not a regular occurrence. So mm -hmm. seeing women like um, Willow and Riho main event um, Dynamite is quite promising um, and have like extended, not just like a five minute main event, but an extended match, which um, was a great match and it, and it went down well on social media. So I think just having, obviously Mercedes is the star of the show, but having her, utilizing her in multiple segments throughout the show, um, could be a beneficial strategy going forward. Here's an interesting question. The title of the video, do WWE have the right approach when signing free agents? Now, we know from all, from all reports that WWE were very much interested um, in re-signing Mercedes. There were quotes um, that were put out today and throughout the week saying that they wanted her part, part back in the family. Obviously, we also know two other free agents that have recently signed for AEW and Will Ospreay and Kazuchika Okada. Um, and Will Ospreay had a very interesting quote on um, an episode of The Talk is Jericho, which I'll read out. Um, when asked if he talked to WWE, Will Ospreay responded, yeah, of course, but it was night and day, even in differences of what they were offering. And what AEW was offering was, be was way better. The scheduling, everything about AEW is completely the right option for me. It was always, you can be a superstar in WWE and famous, but it's not as good as pay. It's not as good of pay. And it's not the kind of schedule I want. I respect everyone there doing it, but it's not for me. Now, there were rumours when that be a knowledge heard, um, and I'm sure you might have heard this as well, when um, Tony Khan was kind of negotiating with Okada, and the rumours were that Tony Khan will not be outbid for Okada. Like he, <laughs> he was adamant that he would not be outbid for Okada. Um, and we spoke about Mercedes being someone who's always advocated for, you know, being paid more. Do you think WWE are essentially lowballing their talent in terms of like compensation? Because it's not a coincidence that for me, Mercedes has signed for AEW. And obviously money's not the ultimate reason, but it's a significant um, factor in this equation. Do you think like, WWE are lowballing talent, but or, or is it a thing of just AW being the new environment that people want to work in? Um, I'm going to throw this question to knowledge first. <laughs> um, mate, I think overall what we've seen over the last couple of years of AW, and I think it can go. Uh, I don't know if you've ever read the Young Bucks book, um, but in the book, 
I don't remember which one it is. I should have really got the quote, but it would have been Matt most likely. He said that when he spoke to Tony Khan, he could tell that Tony Khan knew everything about his career. And he, Tony was excited to talk to Matt. And he said in the book that when he spoke to WWE, he never really got the same impression. Now, they might want you in WWE. I'm sure they really wanted him. But it means a lot to an artist when someone is speaking to you and they know a lot. They know everything about you. And compare that to someone who, you know, is talking to you. You know, they might have seen you a little bit, but he's more talking to you too about merch and, you know, potential other things that we could do in terms of, oh, you know, we could brand you and this and that. And that's exciting too. But, you know, when the guys... You can tell the young bucks, for as an example, really care about their performance, and wrestling comes first to them. And this current generation of pro wrestlers, the performance is key. And it's not like the the eighties when you know guys would go in the ring and barely do anything. You know they'd go on the road and wouldn't even take bumps. Some of them refuse to take bumps. You know on the road, but in in the eighties and the nineties, it's totally different now. Guys care about their work. So when someone like Tony Khan is talking to Will Ospreay. And, dude, I've been to Rev Pro shows where Tony Khan was there. I didn't know it at the time, but I've been to Rev Pro shows where I've I've learned that Tony Khan was in the building. You know, he was at Osprey and Pack, as an example, the first one that comes to mind, 30-minute draw. He was there in the front row. I didn't know who he was at the time, but he was there. He was at the Oku match a couple of weeks ago. Tony Khan is a big fan of Will Ospreay, all right? Now, you compare a guy who's a big fan of you, you've, he's worked for you before, so he knows exactly what you're into, he knows everything about you, and then you compare that to, you know, the WWE approach, and from what I understand was, you know, oh, you know, you can get on WrestleMania, we'll make you a star sort of thing, and it's just like, it's not the same, especially when the other side are offering you more money. And at the end of the day, we are at a time now where the, the wrestling fandom has changed now, the previous generation grew up at a time when WCW was gone and it was just one major promotion. Before that, you had other outlets where guys could go and make money. After WCW went out of business, it was one place where you can go and make money. And that one place, they really, they manipulated the minds of young pro wrestlers into believing that everything in your life should be aimed at getting that WrestleMania moment. WrestleMania yeah. moment, that's what people, that's what, you know, they sold the entire premise of the company around was you want a WrestleMania moment. And now with the internet, guys didn't grow up wanting to watch Seth Rollins. They grew up watching the Young Bucks and Kenny Omega. My son, when he is in his room and he's taking bumps and he's wrestling with his wrestling buddies, he's not pretending to be Roman Reigns at WrestleMania. He's, you know, pretending to be Will Ospreay wrestling Okada at the Tokyo Dome. And that's the generation that we're in now. You know, so you can't, you being WWE is great if you're not into wrestling and you watch TV and you see The Rock and you think, oh, that's cool, I want to do that. But if you've got another company there that's offering you millions and millions of dollars and this guy gives a shit about you and he's promising you all these sorts of matches and he's offering you, you, more, you more money, you know, this is a business. Will Ospreay isn't a mark. And Mercedes is, a, her name is Mercedes Money. It's not Mercedes Mark, you know. It's like we, the, the Times have changed now, is my point. Mm. Times have totally changed. And WWE, if they want to get into the business of signing these free agents, they need to do better. The whole, you know, we can get you on WrestleMania. That's not good enough anymore. It is not good enough. And also, before I keep going on a tangent about this, like, we're at a stage now where, like, WWE, yeah, they're a massive company and all that stuff. We, we get that. But... Actually, you know what? Sorry, I've, I've lost my train of thought. Go ahead. <laughs> no worries. Before I throw the question to Lyric, I want to big up everyone in the comment section. We've got a lot of comments. Um, so um, I will say I will read some comments from earlier. Um, this is these are referring to Mercedes. Um, she stayed true to what she said on the broken skull about getting herself the kind of money the top guys in wrestling make. I remember that one. I remember she used the analogy of steak. She was like, um. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. She's like, I think she said she's grateful for pizza, but she wants steak. But basically, yeah. she wants more substantial uh, money in the company, which absolutely. Um, we got Mark, he's a member. Become a member. Um, you know, we've got a lot of great content behind the membership. We've got our Discord. So if you'd like to become a member, become a member for some extra content like Mark. Um, 
This is in regards to AEW's um, ticket sales. They also book TV tapings in some weird small cities. No surprise why they don't sell many tickets. Um, big up SDKO8. He says, I think WWE's game plan is that they think that WrestleMania is enough to sell people on signing. Uh, big up Supine Smokey. Osprey's value proposition to AEW is greater than it is to WWE, so they will be willing to pay more. All in Wembley is probably a nice sweetener as well. Uh, let's see if we've got any more. I'm sure we do. Uh, big up Mex. Oops. Don't comment. Big up Mex. Uh, I don't think they're necessarily low balling. It's just TK may once and maybe needs these people more. WWE may not want to block their NXT pipeline. <laughs> That's uh, sorry. Go I just on. want to respond to what Mark said there. Um, about these small cities yes rafael morphy when he was in charge of live events he used to book real random bit i think i uh, we had a discussion a while ago nk about um how about you continue <laughs> one of his girls lyric um <laughs> yeah yeah i was saying um rafael morphy used to book towns that AEW did not do good pay-per-view buys and good TV ratings in. That's one. In The Observer a few weeks ago, Dave did a whole big story on it, the fact that a, uh, AEW do shows in these markets where they don't seem to be popular. And, you know, for whatever reason, he did that. He booked them in towns where their pay-per-view buy rates were dead low and their TV demos were really low in those particular markets. So for whatever reason, he did that. Now that he's gone, I believe that the touring is going to be a to is totally different. They're also booking smaller buildings as well. The arena that they've got on Wednesday is a much smaller building compared to what they used to, what they usually run. And I mean, they're at six thousand right now. They most likely will get over six thousand. They might even release tickets, more tickets on the day. But I just want to say that in relation to Mark's comments. Also, one more thing. I don't want to take too much time with his lyrics here. Um, but yes wwe do have the floor of the pipeline in, in in the nxt and stuff like that and a part of me thinks that they don't even care if they sign these free agents because they've got these lot in florida and their fans are fine with their fan the fans will accept them you know it's like we is will osprey cool yeah but you know we've got a guy in florida he's good in nxt has decent matches the company will promote him as being really great and they'll accept that they they like brian pillman over there I think he sucks. I always did think he sucks. And now he's, you know, Tony fumbled, apparently. So I think they know their market and they know their audience, which is super important for them. They know their audience way better than <laughs> way better than anyone else, I would imagine. But anyway, sorry. Yeah, no worries. I think there's a few more comments right here. Um, these free agents maybe don't want to go to the big... Um, Sorry, these three agents also maybe want to go to be the big legendary names of the future names of AW. Being the success that didn't have to go to WWE is also a thing. Yeah, Lyric, um, before I even um, throw the question to you, there was an interesting quote that kind of relates back to kind of maybe what um, enticed Mercedes about AW. Um, this is from the PW Insider. It says, in AW, however, Monet saw more opportunity in that she could arrive as a full-fledged top player for the company giving them a female star that they could build around by bringing her goodwill and popularity as a ratings draw which we discussed earlier given her wwe tv appearances usually meant a spike for the quarter hours one person close to the situation pointed out that monet brought in a million viewers for her debut on dynamite as proof in execution but also stated that there will need to be a lot of work to be done as aw tries to capitalize on that AW also provided a chance for Monet to build a direct relationship with Warner Bros. Discovery as potential access to their film and television franchises. And maybe that's another avenue where in AW you have a lot more freedom to pursue other projects. And Mercedes has been, you know, very candid about pursuing other things. We've seen her in Mandalorian and so on and so forth. But Lyric, let me ask you this. Do you think that, you know, wrestling's a revolving door and there are going to be other free agents maybe not free agents to the magnitude of okada mercedes and will osprey all available at the same time but do you th do you think that for the foreseeable future it's going to be a scenario like this where aw ends up taking the lion share of these free agents or do you see a more back and forth market um so i think that it's a lot of things i think that first off 
I think that WWE is lowballing people, but I think it's because that they can, you know, like at this point, the brand of WWE itself is much bigger than any star that they've had since John Cena, any star that includes Roman Reigns, that includes everybody. Ooh. And the, like the actual brand itself. So when you see when somebody wins a national championship, somebody wins a world championship, what do they do? They send a WWE title bill, right? Like the brand itself is so big. They're not selling wrestling anymore. Look at WrestleMania this past year. Look at the sponsors, the, the sponsors, Turbo Tax in the middle of different ma uh, matches. You have the Prime logo in the middle of the ring. This is now a sponsor's playground like you know like this isn't about wrestling anymore and so at this point yes like they can lowball people because they they want it to be like wrestlemania the the mere and not even you're not guaranteed to actually work wrestlemania just the mere thought of being able to work wrestlemania should be able to entice you now however on the other side you have a full generation of wrestling fans who grew up believing that WWE was the only thing because it was. I am one of those people. Like, you know, I'm 26. So I started watching wrestling after the fall of WCW. So up until 2019, like, there was nothing else. Of course, like, you know, TNA was around. But after TNA lost the Spike deal, any chance in the hell of being a legitimate competitor was over. And so on the other end, you have Tony Khan who, and, and people can say whatever they want about him, but he has a background in both soccer, well, football and football, <laughs> like, you know, so soccer and football, he thinks of wrestling as a sport and he sees his wrestlers as athletes. And so he sees people and like the, when you said he was willing to outbid for Okada because he sees Okada Okada is the equivalent of signing Roman Reigns right now. And in my opinion, better. But, you know, hey, that's just personal preference. And so when you see a star like that, a wrestling company, of course, you're going to bid as high as possible. A true wrestling company, because what you're selling is wrestling. You know, and well, same thing with Will Ospreay, the best wrestling product, a prospect, of, you know, of the decade, of course you're going to overbid. You see Mercedes Monet as a free agent, of course you're going to bid. Because at the end of the day, I don't think WWE is, they don't care about free agents anymore. Not legitimately. Yes, they do have to buy one occasionally. So, you know, Cody, CM Punk, those type of guys. But these are all older guys. You need somebody to slot in for WrestleMania. But look at, we talk about the NXT pipeline. None of, the, none of them have direction for WrestleMania. None of them have red direction for WrestleMania because WWE is a business and they're relying on part-timers versus, think about it, somebody, if somebody Will Ospreay's age in WWE right now is going to be in NXT for at least a couple of years versus you can go to this company and you could be slotted in as a top star immediately. Look at that young core, Swerve, Hangman, um, Osprey, all under thir all under thirty five, like nice. uh, you know, uh, you know, Mercedes. All these people, all under thirty five. There are people their age right now who have been in NXT for years, and you mean that they are already gu guaranteed to be at the top of the car, world title reign, stuff like that. Like you know, like you don't get those type of opportunities ever. So, and you can get paid, and you don't have to work three hundred days a year. And you can maintain your maintain your name, image, likeness, and intellectual property. And you can wrestle how you want and treat and as you could partner. wrestle elsewhere. Yes, you can wrestle elsewhere. You can treat uh, the this is for rest uh, for wrestlers who look at wrestling like art. AEW is the only place to be. But for people who are trying to like, you know, I think Jay Cargo moving to WWE was the best thing that she ever did for herself. She was not trying to be, she flat out said, wrestling was not her end all be all. She wasn't trying to be, you know, wrestler of the year or anything. She flat out said, I want to use wrestling as a place to do all the other things I want to do. I want to go into acting and stuff. That's the difference, like, and that's the difference between Mercedes because although she wants to do all those things, she's made it clear wrestling is her number one and everything else. 
So when yeah. it comes to wrestlers, wrestlers, I mean, there's there's truly no other choice just because the structure of how WWE is right now, like, it's mostly promos. So that's why you see a guy like Chad Gable is probably never going to be world champion. No matter how good he is, like, if you ask me, I would put a belt on him. He's incredible. But, like, the wrestlers, wrestlers, think about Gunther, right? Like, still has the Intercontinental Championship. And all if if it worked like a wrestler's wrestler's company, he would be main event to WrestleMania this year. That's what I wanted. That's what I wanted. I thought that Jim Gunther would be main event to WrestleMania by this year, but instead we're running back last year's main event and adding the rock into the mix. You know, like at the end of the day, like I need mean, MK and a lyric to forgive MJF. No. Oh. <laughs> yeah, oh. I, was, I was waiting for that one. Yeah, no. um, yeah. I will just. Uh, there's been a lot of comments since you've been speaking, oh, but um, I will. I will address these as we go. As much as I would like to see these guys in WWE, there's no doubt the AW fan base will or slash have accepted them anyway, way more than WWE's fan base would. That I'll, I'm gonna circle back 100%. to that one. Yeah, I think. I think. In fact, let's. I think. And that's the thing. Even with Mercedes um, joining AW, we saw a lot of like, let's be honest, some negative vitriol for her like switching sides or whatever. And it, and I feel like with the state of, I, I mean, like I said, me and Lyric are, 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 are practically are, are the same age. Knowledge was there for the Monday Night Wars. Just as like a point of comparison, I'm sure the Monday Night Wars was worse, but as like people who've grown up in like a post like... Um, WWE like takeover era. I have not seen this level of tribalism before. I'm a avid New Japan fan. We stayed in our little corner. We didn't bother no one. As a former TNA fan, we stayed in our little corner. Didn't bother anyone. But now it just feels like just it, cut. From. There was there was tribalism in the nineties during the whole WCW WWF war, but um, it wasn't as bad as this. Is saying that we didn't have Twitter in our pocket at the time so we didn't i mean for you to i mean to see people go back and forth you had to get your observer and then you had to go to the readers page and then you see people you know writing letters to dave saying you're biased against wcw you're pro Vince for all this stuff every week it was always the same or you're pro bischoff and you hate w it's always the same stuff and um i mean I'm, and also i think back then fans i think were used to there being multiple different products on television like you had if you were in the 80s, I mean, God, there were so many different promotions on television. So I don't think fans were ever offended that another promotion actually existed. Nowadays, you know, people, they, they, they as soon as AEW showed up, you could see that they, they were offended that this company even existed to a point where this, that's how, that's how out of the loop they were in terms of how the wrestling business actually worked for generations, really. Um, so I just want to say something regarding what... Um, about Mercedes and this whole thing that she's got going on in, in, in AEW. Um, you asked NK about the pay structure in WWE and if you know, the whole low-balling thing, and they are low-balling. The truth is, though, is that TKO don't, TKO don't spend money on talent. Yeah. They didn't Absolutely. in the UFC. Those UFC fighters, they just left. John Jones hasn't fought for years because he wouldn't get paid. And Connor goes back and forth with playing with them you know, to up his price, you know, to, to try and get more money every so often. And he hasn't fought for ages. I mean, he was injured for a while, but he hasn't fought for ages. You know, he teases and he, he um, and then he pulls out. And then you had the Diaz brothers pop up every so often and they, they change their minds. There's a lot going on with TKO. They're a publicly traded company. They can't afford to, well, they can afford, but they're not going to overspend on anybody unless they have no other options. I mean, they'll give The Rock 30 million to join the board of directors and stuff like that. But, you know, they're not going to give Will Ospreay $4 million a year. He's unproven. You know, in, in their minds, he's unproven. He's, you know, he's the guy that had the matches with Ricochet, you know, to, maybe to them. You know, that's who they probably think he still is at this point. Yeah, just oh. to add to your point, um, Knowledge, Atlas says Ngarni was a heavyweight champion yeah. and didn't re-sign because the UFC low-balled him. Yeah. They low-balled him. And, you know, he was a, he was a big draw at the time. His pay-per-views did monster numbers. And... um they could have got him. I mean, God, he's making a lot more money now than that Anthony Joshua. You know what? <laughs> that Anthony Joshua fight, you know how much buys it did? No. 5,000 on TV. That seems low. That's incredibly low, but it's That's a Saudi low. show and they don't yeah, give a shit about that. So they got paid, but 
by the way, so when people say EW's pay per view buy rates are really bad or whatever, like, just put that into comparison. I just want to put that out there. But I mean, you've got all these WWE wrestlers whose deals are up this year. Okay, you've got Seth Rollins, you've got Becky Lynch, Ricochet was floating his uh, was was floating around that his deal was up as well. Sheamus, I believe, is up this year as well. Um, yeah, okay, Sheamus is up, right? So those guys are at home right now, and they're they're opening up their phones and they're seeing this number that is floating around for Okada. All right, and they know what you know. Word gets around in wrestling, so they know exactly what Mercedes is on, or they know the ballpark or what she's on. And also Osprey as well. Becky Lynch is, you know, she's she in her head, I'm sure, feels that she should get paid way more than Mercedes does. So when she goes back, when she's negotiating, you know, what is she going to do? You know, she's going to want more money than Mercedes. Do you think TKO are going to pay her what more money than Mercedes? They might. I don't know. But it's an interesting conversation to have. Seth Rollins, you know, in his in his mind, I'm sure he believes in his head that he's better than Okada. I'm sure he does. I'm sure he believes that he's better than Will Ospreay and he's better than Kenny Omega as well. They all earn more money than him, though. So this is, you know, do you remember the years ago he was, told, oh, you know, I earn more money than Will Ospreay and all this stuff. Not anymore. But he's he's heard these numbers and he's like, man, Okada's well, got this or Will Ospreay's got that. I need to get that much. Are they going to pay him? I know a man who would, you know. <laughs> I'm gonna be honest. I don't even. I don't think so. I don't think that Okada. I don't think not Okada. I don't think Tony Khan breaks breaks the bank for some of these guys. Like, I'm gonna be honest. Not, yeah. Okay. Sure. That's true. Not maybe not for. Um. Sorry. Not for maybe not for all of them. But he could if he wanted to. Becky he, Lynch. He could, could if he could. wanted to. But at the end of the day, let's think about it. In 2024, how much is Seth Rollins' post injury worth? Like the, and think about the main event, I actually don't know probably and like think about like with the the actual my like Okada is thirty six and still in his prime. Definitely. Osprey is thirty years old, hasn't hit his prime. Mercedes is thirty two, <laughs> and in her prime, these are investments into building blocks of the future. Like you know, okay, uh, uh, Tony Khan is a lot of things, but he's not investing in like. Posting W.O., Kevin Nash, people who are just here for a money grab. I truly believe that but unless, like, Ilya Dragunov becomes available tomorrow, I don't think that these big contracts are going out for just about anybody. Like I said, he treats it as a sport and athletes. Like, you know, you're not going to pay for – you're not paying eight figures like they said that Mercedes got. You're not getting eight figures – for people who can't keep up with the the <laughs> workload like because at the end of the day people are expecting yes it's a it's a shorter schedule but you're expected every time you go out there four stars minimum, oh, minimum. i don't think seth rollins could keep up at this stage of his career i definitely don't think he no. could keep up with any of them i will say this though i think he's probably i think he's a lot more useful than edge and I, I and I like I like Adam Copeland. I think he's done really well. You can ask Enka. I was not a fan of Edge joining AEW in any way, but I think he's been brilliant, absolutely brilliant. But I think at this stage, I think he's a bigger deal than Edge, and I think he'd probably be a. a I think a, he's a, a bigger deal than Edge. I think he's a bigger deal than Edge. However, Edge wasn't getting record breaking money. I don't think that he was. I don't think he's getting record breaking money. I think that did he AEW definitely offered more than WWE, but like WWE is lowballing everybody. But I think that at the same time, Edge had a clear role of what he wanted to do. He knows he's 50 years old. He said he wants to retire there with his best friend. He wants to have, you know, cool matches with the young generation. He's not expecting to be world champion. If Seth Rollins goes over to AEW, he's expecting to be the world champion. That's the difference. That is that's the difference. Edge knows what his role is. Like, you know, like he gets it. He's a veteran. That you know, Seth Rollins isn't coming to put over young talent. He expects to be a world champion. I think you made you made a great point, Lyric, about um Tony Khan treating it's like a sport. And in terms of that's what you do in sport. You we see it all the time, whether it's like football soccer teams or American football teams you you scout the young talent early you scout you you, you scout young talent yes. you look for people who are young who are going to serve the company long term of course in the cases of something like a CM Punk for example that was something that any any business promoter you can't miss and you know despite how it ended CM Punk did tremendous business for them 
I mean, all out, all out 2021 is their highest selling pay, highest selling pay per view of all time, and that was largely attributed towards CM Punk. Now, the show itself was phenomenal top to bottom, but CM Punk, you can accredit him for the bulk of those pay per view sales. And I think the way to I think a lot of people ascribe Tony Khan as this he's a money mark, he's just got hella money to throw. This guy comes from two very sporting backgrounds. And one thing about sport, the market is ultra competitive. There is a constant, especially from like those he's a prem he manages Fulham, a Premier League club. He knows about transfer windows, he knows about he's a sports guy, literally. So in the terms of the acquisition of talent. I think that's a major advantage that Tony Khan has because he comes from backgrounds that are ultra competitive when it comes to talent. I don't say that WWE don't have the acumen. I mean, the WWE are a company that's too big to fail. The allure of WWE will sweep up some wrestlers and will sweep up a lot of wrestlers. But I think this is the first time in at least decades where somebody's actually known what they're doing and had the money to back it up. Because there's been people, and I'm sure knowledge can attest to this, who've come into wrestling with a bit of money, but don't necessarily have the know-how or the relationships. I remember. So many. Yeah. Dixie when Carter. Yeah, exactly. Did the, the Dixie Carter, did Dixie Carter messed up the relationship with Spike because of what? Vince Russo. Yeah, it was good old Vince Russo. It was, <laughs> yeah. She lost TV because of Vince Russo. Um, That's a crazy hill to die on. Yeah, I just want to say. Crazy hill to die on. That's a crazy hill to die on. Awful. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. I think also. Go no, 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 please go ahead. I was going to say also of just Okada becoming available was truly a once in a lifetime opportunity. Like that is a guy who was not just the face of New Japan Pro Wrestling; he was the face of Japanese wrestling. Period. So to get the ace of Japanese wrestling for him to become available, period, is crazy. So, like, to not do everything possible to get him is really insane. And it shows, like, just the thought process towards actual wrestling right now in WWE. And also, let's just be honest, for international talent, for people who are not American, AEW has made themselves the most comfortable place to be. Look at how everybody has been slotted in and positioned. Osprey lives in the UK, not having to, uh, to relocate, right? Like, of genuinely caring about that. Pack is also one of those people. And think about even the position of Okada as a Japanese talent, specifically of not making him change his character for him to be able to like, you know, be slotted in, I would say, not in a stereotypical Japanese way, as we've seen sometimes, you know, when Japanese wrestlers go over to America. Same thing with Takeshita, for people to be able to retain their style. Because that's another thing, too. You also have to, essentially, to go over there, you have to lose everything that made you special in the first place. You have to water down your style. We probably would have saw Okada shooting out mist for the first time. Throwing salt and having flute music. Like... You know, I just, I mean, and or do you know what they do as well? They make foreign people out to be totally stupid, like they make them out to be infantile, absolutely. Like, Infantilization like, like children of, of the foreign talent, like Okada still feels like the final boss mm. in the in this presentation. Like, honestly, putting him with the elite, like you know, he has a mouthpiece, but he also can speak for himself. Yeah, to play devil's advocate, right? To play because I've heard because I, I fundamentally agree, but I've heard the argument that yes, while WWE have the track record of you know, you know, we can name multiple, you know, foreign city Japanese wrestlers who've kind of been, for lack of a better term, bastardized in WWE. AW, a lot of people would argue that AW haven't earned that goodwill yet because there hasn't been like that one Japanese talent to rise to the top that Takeshita's push. Takeshita's push is stop and start. These are the... Absolutely. The, I, the, I can agree. Yeah, oh, so oh. these are like the devil's advocate arguments I'm hearing about. Okay, but NK, mm. how many Japanese males are signed to AEW? Two. 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 All right, let's go. All right, two, all right? They got two. Takeshita is stop and start, all right? And that's... But that's not the company being 
racist or anything. They do that with a lot of people in AEW. You could point to 20 guys on that roster and you can go uh, Pac or Ricky Starks or Penta or, or, or whoever. That's not a solely Takesha a thing. But also, if you, I mean, even Sheeta, how much times is she, Sheeta's like promoted as one of the top women there? She's won the, the, the title. Division. Yeah, multiple times she's won the title. I think people just say these things, you know, there's, oh, you know, so and so, New Japan talent that coming in with belts. It's like, are you stupid? You can't put an, uh, you can't put a world title on a guy who doesn't work for you. That's stupid. What, what happens if you don't come back? <laughs> and also, I would say, like, the, you've never seen AEW turn a Japanese wrestler into a comedy wrestler. Akira Tozawa used to be one of the, I would say, best wrestlers in the world and is now a comedy wrestler, which he does extremely well. But she does completely extremely well. He has a lot of range, and I think that he's so talented. But let's just be real. The amount of people. Think about Tajiri. Tajiri was one of the best wrestlers in the absolute world. And just, you know, gets turned into a comedy act. And don't get me wrong. Somebody said, is Tucson is enough for Japanese males at AEW? Absolutely not. But I don't think it's, like, from lack of urge or trying. Like, you got to think for Japanese wrestlers to make that jump to the states that's a whole different thing outside of just companies like that's relocating your life relocating your family also like you know learning getting past the language barrier it's a huge thing um but let's just be real like we've never seen um Takeshita become a comedy wrestler we've never seen okada shoot not missed no 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 uh cool no. you can there go back a lot of you go on, on. on no i just no, wanted no, to, okay. yeah i just wanted to say that you know for years <laughs> The only guys in from Japan that actually got over big in the US and were given an opportunity where well, there was Muto uh in the 80s and to the night towards the 90s and Liger came in in the early 90s in WCW and he was presented as something special and then later on there was Dragon but in WWE for all those years I mean you the whole time Vince McMahon took over the company uh from 84 onwards how many guys how many Japanese born wrestlers were actually promoted as being something special the one that was promoted as being someone special was really a Samoan gangster, Yokozuna. He wasn't Japanese. Yeah, <laughs> you know, so, and yeah. also, I mean, if you look at Joshi wrestling specifically and women's wrestling, like, you know, during the 90s, like, you know, Joshi wrestlers, when they did come up over to WWF, they, that part, those partnerships were eventually dissolved because they were outshining the men. They were they outshining the men. Aja Kong did not end up being a big star in the U.S. The Crush Gals, some the one of the most popular acts of all time, were incredibly popular, incredibly popular. And all the first iteration of the women's tag team championships <laughs> in WWF were originally held what by Joshi wrestlers, Jumping Bomb Angels. Yes, and absolutely. NK, there was a team. You ever heard of the Jumping Bomb Angels? Yeah, I've heard of them. Mm -hmm. They were a fantastic tag team, all right? And they used to go out there with uh, Judy Martin and Lalani Kai. And they used to have these awesome matches on the road. Like, and they, even on TV, they had these fantastic matches. You're talking about three and a half, four star matches back then, you know, in WWE, which was very rare. And they were working too hard. So obviously they were told, you know, you, you need to learn how to work and you need to slow it down. And, you know, you're doing too much and you're doing too much high spots. And by the end of their run, they were just a regular bloody tag team. It was like they were just a regular tag. Totally took away everything that was special about them and made them into just a regular run-of-the-mill tag team. And, and a lot of that, oh, sorry. No, no, please go ahead. I was going to say a lot of that was due to Fabulous Mula, who essentially oh was the gatekeeper of professional, of women's wrestling for yeah. decades. Even back then. She's actually, she's a native of Columbia, South Carolina, my hometown. So, like, I, I really know this. And and the thing is, the reason why American wrestling is so far behind every other wrestling market is because of Moolah and her influence of essentially being that gatekeeper of people weren't able to be successful unless she essentially said so. She had she essentially had the final say so for decades and really held back American women's wrestling, which we still see today, which ended up how we ended up in a broad panties era, which how we ended up in, you know, the divas era and why we're still so behind um, like Japan and, you know, these other wrestling markets. It all starts from back then. And, and when that influence came in, Jumping Bomb Angels, Crush Gals, Aja Kong, all of these different, Bull Nakano, um, which is so interesting that she's going into the Hall of Fame this year, it was frowned upon. And it wasn't accepted, not by management. Fans loved it, but you know, like it wasn't treated well 
at all. Crush Girls were working for WWE during that period as well. They got over big on the road as well. But um, once again, you know, the work was the work was too much. They couldn't do it. And yeah, Moolah, Moolah had that control. NK, you got to remember when all Japan women were tearing it up over there and drawing huge, the WWE had Moolah as their world champion. Right. And she was at the time she was in her 60s. 60s. She was in her 60s. You know, she they had Wendy Richter as their star, and then she had a falling out with Moolah. So then they screwed, <laughs> they double crossed her, and they took the Moolah took the belt off her. Don't know if you ever heard that story. That's a story for another time. But that was the original Vince McMahon double cross where they stole the belt off of Wendy Richter. Um, and then yeah, she controlled. She booked that world title. She took it from her and her husband. Her husband was called Buddy Lee, and he was the guy who ran women's wrestling for years and years and years. And he was a sexual predator. He was a rapist. He was, the guy was awful. And he was married to Moolah. Before then, he was married to June Baya, and he ruined her life. And then you know she controlled women's wrestling. And Vince was so loyal to her. Vince the man senior was loyal to her. And then when this company was sold to to Junior. You know, she was one of the people that he had to protect. Uh, him, uh, sorry, her, Monsoon, Lou Albano, Scarland, those were the inner circle event senior that he had to look after. That's why she was always presented as being the god of women's wrestling, even till, what, five years ago when that... Yeah, when they happened. had to change the, the name of the... <laughs> the battle battle royal. Royal name, And she used to actually run a compound. So it was the Moolah compound here in Colombia, And it was uh, a collection of buildings and wrestlers lived there and trained there and she essentially took out you know percentages of their earnings mm -hmm. um and essentially like she was essentially she was a pimp yeah a pimp. she was a pimp and, she, she and a if pimp. you believe the stories that's what she was as well she used to send those girls out there to do all sorts of stuff with people and Absolutely. she'd get the money back if you believe that i believe that i was heard i heard that for years and years and years and but. american women's wrestling is built in her image yes it was yeah totally Sorry, we went off there. All right. anyway. <laughs> yeah. Can't oh. hear NK. Are you muted? Oh, NK, sorry. can't hear you. One sec. No. You good? Should we continue talking, Lyric, while yes. NK's doing this? <laughs> um, I'm trying to figure out. <laughs> I, I feel like it's taking a negative turn, but you know, like, I just, I think that when you know the history behind certain things, a lot of things make sense. And I think another thing that mercedes brought up in like that came out in the pw insider report is it wasn't just about money it's creating a new direction for women's wrestling like especially after you've been to japan man i i i you was there this year yeah yes, i was fortunate yeah. to go to japan this year and like when you experience how women's wrestling is treated how it's adored how it's like treated so carefully and how it's portrayed and how it's positioned and coming back to America, it's like, <laughs> it's literally night and day. And I can only, and that's for me as a fan. So imagine how a wrestler feels, you know, it's just like a completely different treatment. And I can only imagine like knowing that it has to start with somebody, the change in women's wrestling, it has to begin with somebody and you know hey i always believe that black women are always at the forefront of change in any type of movement whether in in sports we saw it in tennis we've seen it in you know college women's yeah. basketball here in the u.s yeah. wrestling obviously is going to be no different and so it may you know it makes complete sense for her to be at the the forefront of this movement but like for women's wrestling specifically to change and especially when you have a billionaire on your side saying that he's going to fund a project, that's not, you know, that's not, not a terrible way to go, essentially, especially since they've been building the roster, building it up. There's still people who still haven't returned. There's still people who haven't debuted. Um, debuted. You have, you have yeah. Bain, who still has yet to debut. You have Jamie Hayter, who still has to return. You have Britain, you know, Britt Baker, well. who also has to return. The division is stacked. You have people who have just come back from injury. Potentially. Amidata, well. 
You said who? Oh, yeah, Camille as well. You have Aminata who came back from injury swinging. Same thing with Red Velvet. You know, like, you have all of these people who are honestly, like, who can who can go if who if they're given the opportunity and i think that we're seeing you know never mind i'm not going to go there i'm not going to go no, there you can say it you okay. can say it i want to go there then. i, I think that. that we're seeing a shift right now i think a division between wrestling fans and i've seen a, especially with women in wrestling because i see how for the the real fans of course you're going to have the weirdos who are just sexist and misogynist and are weird towards women. I'm not talking about them. But amongst true fans, I see a difference in the fandom towards WWE women versus AEW women versus I feel like AEW fans are hardcore fans for wrestling, period. So it's more focused on the actual wrestling versus WWE. I always see it more so about what they're wearing or, you know, how they look or, and don't get me wrong. You have some people who say that about AEW too, 100%. But I, it's more so like, especially like with the NXT girls, it's so aesthetic facing to where it kind of feels like some people want the Divas era back. And I would rather people just be honest about it. Like, you know, if that was your thing, cool. But just be honest about it. Some people really want the Divas era back. Like, you know, they're not looking to see like, you know, these classics, and they're, they're not, that's not what they're looking for. They're looking for promo battles. They're looking like, yes, mother, eat, like all that slay, like, you know, like, and yeah, that, that's, that's, that's. There what we go. For. I'm back, guys. Sorry, <laughs> technical difficulties. My laptop completely just went haywire. Um, yeah, I but I like appreciate you guys for holding me down, though. <laughs> But before, before, oops, sorry, before I went off, I wanted to address some of the comment sections because, you know, there was a lot of interesting comments definitely from the conversation you guys are having. But before we do, make sure you guys like, comment, and subscribe. Make sure you share the stream. If you guys are watching on, you know, on delay, not live, make sure you like. We appreciate Lyric and Knowledge for breaking down a lot of the history of women's wrestling. Some of the stuff I didn't even know myself. I, I could talk know. about Moolah for hours. <laughs> yeah. I could talk about June by like, uh, hours. Research project on that eventually, just because like I'm actually here where she did a lot of stuff. So have you seen Lipstick and Dynamite, the documentary? I haven't seen it yet. I'm, I'm looking for a link for it. So if you have it, please send it to me. I'll see if I've got one. It might be dead at this point because it's like a, a very old doc, but it's pretty awesome. Um, I'll see if I still got it. Mm -hmm. I was gonna say, NK, um, about Mercedes going back to what we just I'm, I'm literally remembering this stuff and having to refer back to it but you mentioned the fact that she in her contract potentially has got links with TBS and, and stuff like that do you do you know that Hulk Hogan had uh, the same deal in his initial WCW contract that's the only wrestler I can think of that had um Hogan actually had it in his contract that he had TV projects with TBS and TNT. Oh, really? yeah he had, uh, I believe it was three made-for-TV movies. He had three ninjas, Kickback, I think it was called, that was going to be produced by TNT and TBS. And he had Assault and Devil's Island. And he also had Thunder in Paradise that was worked into his contract. So I don't know if Mercedes is going to have anything similar or she's going to have projects coming out on TBS. Mm -hmm. But I found that quite interesting when that was reported earlier on today. Okay. So one of the, one of the comments, this is from early back on. M. Jeff was given the keys to the home of professional wrestling and invited sports and entertainment to the house. He deserves to be grounded, but it's time to let him out of his room now. I think, I think, um, do you want to know something? I think that Max, he's very online, even though he might say he's not, he's very online. And I could imagine he's sitting at home, healing up. I'm sure from what I hear, he's, he's, he's nearly coming back, but um, he's at home and I, he probably sees this as a challenge because every day I see a lot of Max disrespect. Oh, where does he fit in? Oh, he doesn't fit in anymore. Max is super talented. He's one of the best promos in wrestling. He's a really awesome wrestler. And I can imagine he's sitting back there and he's probably thinking, ah, oh, do you want to see something? Okay, watch. He, he's going to prove everyone wrong. He's re he really is. And he's got years left anyway. He's not going I would wrong. like to be proven wrong. I would you, say, you, I would. You're I would... Home, are you? Here's it. I think that Max is very talented, but I don't think that the past year his career has been his best work at all. 
-hmm. And it was supposed, and it should have been because that was him holding the world title. And I'm not sure if he got scared or nervous or what, but it just was not a reflection of what I think all of us knew he was capable of. And I think that's where the frustration comes from. And so absolutely, I think that he's watching, he's plotting and all these things, but he cannot come back as the MJF that we saw in 2023. Yeah. There's going to have to be some character reinvention because, yes, that version does not fit in. Uh, was it a year? For me, it was the full year. I'm going to be honest. I wasn't really high up on the entire reign. Um, I think that the matches were fantastic because he's a fantastic wrestler. But sadly, most of his, most of his you know, time doesn't revolve around matches. He's a guy who gets 20-minute promos on Dynamite, and a good portion of them sucked. And so I think that he's... The, yeah. The, the tofu promos. Yes, oh, and God. I think that he's so much more talented than what we saw. So what we saw in 2023, if that comes back, no, he doesn't fit. We're going to have to see some substantial character reinvention. And also, he's going to have to wrestle more. I'm going to be honest that a gimmick that Raw evolves around barely wrestling, it just doesn't work in AEW. And I'm going to be honest, especially, like, think about it. If you have two major wrestling products, WWE and AEW, if WWE has a part-time champion who we barely see and AEW is supposed to be the wrestling company, it's not acceptable <laughs> to have a champion who doesn't wrestle often. Like, because that means that both, I will say, like, 2023 was a terrible year for world champions across the board. Between Roman, MJF, Sonata uh, over at New Japan, terrible year for him, world champions across the board. So he's just going to have to wrestle more because the thing is, you're going to quickly fall out of favor with the fans. And you can be a heel and wrestle often. But Because let, let me tell you this, at the same time, you might not want to wrestle all the time, but Will Ospreay will. He'll wrestle every single week. He'll wrestle on Dynamite and Collision Rampage if you let him. And he'll give you four plus stars every single time. So if you don't want to wrestle, that's fine. But you will get replaced quickly because the roster is too stacked. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to move through these comments quickly. Luke makes a good point, but Seth is not shot at 37. I didn't say he was shot. He no, just he can't so. build around him right now. Um... LOL, it's about in reference to Tony Khan. LOL is paying for people that can't keep up, but Marina Fru Marina Shafir still on the payroll. Let's be real. Um, Edge is getting elite veterans pay. Yes. Mike, uh, this is let's see what's the comment here. This comment's not showing Marina up. Marina doesn't get used that much. And um, she's not getting paid eight figures. She's not yeah. getting paid eight figures, but also Tony Khan doesn't release people from their contracts. He's made a commitment to Marina Shafir for how many years? It could be two, it could be three. If mm -hmm. he decides to renew her at that point, he does. If he doesn't, you know, but yeah, that we were all there. Yeah. Uh Mike G, Parson Rollins, Tony should go after Gunfar, Jagunov types, Hoopers only. Yes. Oh well, um, I don't think he should even bother with any of them, really. I think those guys—they've been on WWE TV for years. They're typecasted in that particular era. It's like you don't need them anyway. Walt is different, though. I will sell my off. left foot for Ilya Dragunov. I'm not gonna hold you. Um, <laughs> I will. I will trade. It's about five wrestlers from AEW. I will trade them right now for one Ilya Dragunov. I'm not even gonna trade. I'm just like for Ilya right now. If you told me I can get Dragunov versus Danielson tomorrow, 100. percent I'm sorry, yeah. I got to. Mm. All right, let's act. Um, this is from Supan Smokey, I believe. Smokey. He says, Let's not act like Seth's not a hooper. Um, SDK Seth can definitely go where line if you don't think he can. Okay, I'm gonna skirt through some of these um later I think, comments. I want to say this, NK. Sorry, I want to say I think Seth can go. I just don't think he can go at the level that other people can, and that's not a knock because yes. we're, in, we're in an era where. You know, Osprey and Okada and Kenny, these Brian Daniels, these are the greatest wrestlers of all time. So yes. when I'm saying he's not at that level, that's not an insult. Most wrestlers that have ever existed on on that level, he's really good. He's a really good wrestler, but his output is nowhere near. His output isn't even a tenth of Will Osprey's, maybe even less than a tenth. And that's and once again, I don't I don't want to sound like I'm knocking him because I think he's a talented guy, but you know, let's be real here. He's he's not there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, let me see. Um, okay. J 
just wanted to add that AEW technically has four Japanese male talents signed, Ibushi and Nakagawa. Obviously, they, they also have Shibata on the roster Shibata. as well. They also have Shibata on the roster as well. Oh, that Blackpool Combat Club tease with um, Shibata. Right? <laughs> 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 that makes that me excited. Shibata's not hero. Uh, okay, cool. Um, big up Sat in Yangi, lyric and knowledge. Hey, Sat. About to have an intelligent conversation about wrestling. Um, let's see. Let's see if there's any more comments down below. Sorry, there was a lot of comments to throw for it when, when I was lagging. Um, let me see. Yeah, SDK again. He says, hmm, I think it's wrestling up and down the board in North America. There's a certain aesthetic women have and are playing up to. Yes. But more so in one place. It's fan. I mean, he also says it's fans from both sides. Um, MJF and let me see this. MJF and Omega really proves that he still has a place in this company. Yes, when he wrestles. MJF has definitely got a place in AEW. I think MJF is awesome. I will say this though. I kind of feel like that Adam Cole program that we're going to get. I kind of feel like it's going to. I don't want to say it's bogging him down and it's dragging him down a bit because it hasn't happened yet. I but I kind of wish that they hadn't even bothered that he could just come back as a heel because he's going to have to come back as a baby face. They've got to get that blood feud out of the way. And after that, well, then maybe we can get some sort of uh, change in, in the MJF character, you know, because I'm sure Adam Cole and him will be really good as long as it's pro wrestling focus and there's no silliness. I don't I think it will. And I think another good thing, I think it's going to have to be really silly and it's not going to be promo wrestling focused because Adam Cole is not healed. So it's going to be mostly promo based. And it's just like, if he could just come in and like do something completely fresh and work with like one of these other guys, I think we'd be having a completely different conversation. I think people would be excited. But the mm. fact that he's coming back to be doing that same old shit for pre worlds in is not good. Like, it's just not going to, I don't think it's going to be good, especially when you have Osprey, Okada, Swerve, everybody else. Merced, now you have to, he has to compete with the women now too. Like, that's the thing. Like, everybody is like on such a high level. And think about what are the lowest performing segments right now on Dynamite? What are the things that people hate the most? The Undisputed Kingdom shit, the Wardlow stuff. So I just don't think like, I, I wish he was coming back and doing something fresh, but this devil angle is going to hold. Is going to bring him down. Uh, just tuning in, big up what? Just tuning in, big up the man name. You discuss Yuma Algoi versus Ilya Dragunov main event in NXT versus AJ All Japan at Worlds Collide. Yeah, um, we spoke about the um, you know, Japanese wrestlers. I feel, and obviously AW and New Japan have the big, you know, forbidden door relationship. Mm -hmm. WWE and All Japan Pro Wrestling have been, you know, working together. I don't really follow NXT, so I don't really have the insight to speak on it too tough. But what have been your thoughts on the outside looking in about this WWE All Japan Pro Wrestling relationship? I hate it. Um, and I think that it I was actually I was actually present for Charlie Dimson's All Japan match. I was actually in Japan. Um, so I was actually there. Um if WWE actually had if they actually had an intention of being a partner, I think we would be having a completely different conversation, but they don't. And it, it came out, obviously. So all Japan, they just recently released the um, the lineup. I just actually dropped a champion carnival preview this earlier today, but they just released the dynamite, uh, not dynamite, the lineup for their champion carnival tournament. And you can tell by the blocks that because they just threw some like no name foreigners in there. You can tell they were they were holding spots for they were hopefully going to get some WWE involvement and they didn't get that. And so they would never I don't think that they would ever like they've already dropped the ball with this partnership. Like they got what they wanted out of it and they they're not helpful. But. Yumoyaki versus um, Ilya Dragunov. If it did happen, it would pop me. It would make me extremely happy. I think that apparently, it, apparently we've been trolled. Guap said it was a joke. No, it definitely is a joke. I know, I knew it was a joke. Um, but I just had to get my shit off. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I, but yeah, um, Yumoyaki just had a great match with Kanosuke Takeshita though. Um, this week. yeah, 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 yeah. He, yeah. Um, 
But yeah, I feel bad for all Japan though. They've been having, a, you know, that was one little slip up for them, but they've been having a great past year outside of that. I think I think WWE working with any promotion, um, I think has me looking sideways. I've been around for a long time. I followed wrestling my entire life. It's like I see this stuff. And I know people say, oh, it's Triple H, it's this and that. You know, he's different. You know, he's different from the old man. The old man was the worst. I always say it, he was the worst. Vince Man was, you know, he's the most selfish wrestling promoter there ever was. <laughs> and, and he, you know, he never done anything for any other promoter. He was always self-serving. And Triple H, yeah, he's not the old man, but he, him, and, him and Regal, they really did a number on British wrestling. They they really killed Brit Rest. It's like they them and those shitty NXT contracts. Oh, you guys, you can work uh you can work up it's like no. No, we changed your mind, you can't do it anymore. You know, that rest British wrestling was so was so great at the time, and then NXT UK killed came in and killed it. For what but who's benefit as well? Who did it really benefit NXT UK? What Pete Dunn and uh Tyler Bate, fucking Tyler Bate was in NXT for so long, I forgot he was there. You know, and and Walter came along later on, but none of them really benefited of it. Only thing it did was it killed the British seed pretty much, and they've had to restart. They've had to start again, um, all because of world of sport. And you know, I think also, sport. if you look at if you look at the press conference after Royal Rumble, and you hear how he talked about TNA of just like you know sometimes yeah. potentially we do stuff for the little people, yeah. and TNA got a, like you know. A spot in the rumble and then their ratings actually went down their ratings went down they didn't get like you know no type of mutual promotion they won't they won't they will do a whole social media campaign about your stuff but you won't even retweet their stuff it's it's stuff like that of even like pro wrestling noah of like don't get me wrong i'm super happy that shinsuke nakamura was able to like you know aid in the mood of retirement but there's never been any follow-up from that like everything is super transactional obviously coming up for wrestlemania week Shayna baszler has now been confirmed for blood sport which i am very excited about i will say like i'm very excited for her to do blood sport but let's not act like you know WWE is actually going to advertise that she's doing something for GCW. Absolutely not. And even if they do give you something, it's like, you can do it, but we're not going to talk about it. Same thing. And Mercedes has said that of just like, you know, feeling like when she got the Mandalorian, there was no, the company didn't promote it or, you know, give her any type of, you know, marketing for it. It's just like, it's almost like the downside of becoming this star for them of, Yes, we will uplift the stuff that you do, but only the stuff that you do with us. That's it. Like, don't expect anything else because you won't get it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I love Brit Rest, but there's a small chance it will recover to the heights. I mean, I feel like there needs to be. So too, but that's it. Shouldn't be in that position. It shouldn't mm -hmm. be in that position. They did that. Regal did that. You can say what you want. Oh, Steve Regal. You know, you grew up with him on TV, and it was funny when Jericho pissed in his tea or whatever. Like, but at the end of the day. It was them. They done that. So when I see Triple H, you know, and these two, oh, Triple H is doing this and he's doing that, it means nothing to me. I can see through all of that stuff. I see, I see, I see Triple H on documentaries talking about Vince McMahon taking wrestling out of smoky buildings and stuff like that. So it's like I, I know exactly what that guy's game is. I always have. He was never. Sorry, you hear that dog? Excuse yeah, that's right. <laughs> I got one dog in there. I don't have three. WrestleMania, you guys are right, but in the same breath, we have already acknowledged that WWE is a business, a brand, so we shouldn't be surprised when they act in a transactional manner. I'm not surprised I, at all. I'm not surprised I'm not, at all. Yeah, I'm not surprised people, at all. It's, yeah. it's other people grifting podcasts and stuff like that, pretending that no better as well, that pretend that it's not transactional. Yeah. That's what irritates me. WWE is what they are. It's, you know, it's what they are. It's what they do. They've been like that since, you know, when I was, before I was even born. Mm. Mm. I have to say, again, devils, I have to say, it because I know there's probably good, somebody's probably going to comment this, but what about AEW's relationships? Are they, can they also be classified as transactional? Because I know that is a growing sentiment amongst the community. I think people have to be honest about like the actual Japanese market, because typically when people say transactional, they mean, they mean New Japan. Mm -hmm. the, the yen is down. People are getting tremendously underpaid. 
foreigners, most foreigners in New Japan are not getting signed to anything more than a one year contract. And I'm going to be honest, like <laughs> New Japan, a lot of the stuff, and I, and I say this as somebody that loves New Japan. I, but you know, like I, I love New Japan. I go to their shows in Japan. I've been to their shows in the U.S. and I still go. But a lot of their problems are 100% self-inflicted. They have not prepared for their future in the way that they should have. And one in, in any type of shape of manner. So yes, Okada was the pinnacle performer in Japan and was immensely underpaid to all of his peers in the industry. And so if he goes off looking for a better payday, it made complete sense. Same thing with Osprey. Osprey begged on camera over and over and over again, all 22 and all 23 long, give me the ball. I want to be the guy. I want to carry New Japan. What did they do? They gave a year-long title reign to Sonata. <laughs> Same thing with Zack Sabre Jr. So let's not get like let let's let's not be confused if he ever decides to go elsewhere. These guys screamed, begged in the camera while putting up some of the best performances in wrestling, saying, "Give me the ball. I can be the guy. Pick me. Choose me." Love me in New Japan. What did they do? House of Torture, evil. That is that's what happened. So we want to talk about transactional, and I'm gonna be like I've said before. Okada becoming available was a once in a lifetime opportunity. If he becomes available, any wrestling company worth their weight in salt has to jump. You would have been an idiot not to. Would have been an idiot not to. And obviously, AEW is good at partnerships. Look at CMLL. Look at look at CMLL right now. And I'm gonna be honest. Triple A shot themselves in the foot because Conan wants to be, you know, in the WWE, and he ruined a good thing, a good thing that he had. And now CMLL has slotted themselves into, into that position, and it's much more seamless. Now you have the BCC going to Arena Mexico, and even like I said just recently. Takeshita, still working DDT, having a dual contract. You're seeing the doors open with, with stardom. There's now a working partnership there. You have uh, partnerships with um, Tokyo Joshi Pro. You have That's partnerships right. with, you know, with all these places. So, like, I don't think that AEW didn't, isn't poaching people, but they would be absolute idiots to not make offers. And, and also, I just want to, well, I've got nothing to add on what you said, by the way. I just want to say, um, I mean, it's in New Japan's benefit that these wrestlers go to AEW Absolutely. so that they can still get dates on them. Jay White, Jay White, Osprey, Okada, they're not going to use Shibata anymore, fine. But the rest of them, that you, if anything, you'd be praying that they go to these people so that you can still get dates on them. They can still do Wrestle Kingdom potentially or demit or whatever shows you want them to do. I mean, look at, this Chicago show that's coming up. Look at the new. Look at the AEW talent that's advertised for that show. Look at the look at the tickets that they sold. The, the, new, new Japan has CMLL, AEW, Stardom, and I think TNA involvement on yep. that show. Five yep. different promotions. Biggest gate they've ever done in the U.S. Yep. Five different promotions. So, like the thing is, and also. New Japan loves the relationship with AEW, as they should. As they should. They're, the fact, because to be honest, to be quite honest, with the way that they've been managing things lately, uh, sometimes I think they deserve nothing. <laughs> <laughs> the fact that they're getting this much. And also, yeah, you got Jack Perry. You got one of the pillars, somebody that, that they're clearly high on to go into your New Japan Cup. And then you get AEW involvement in your G1. Got AEW, you got them for your G1. Get them for your World Tag, World Tag League. You get an AEW main eventer to carry your international main event for Wrestle Kingdom. Here's the thing. Now, I, don't get me wrong. I know that New Japan fans should be a bit are pissed. Like, you know, you lost your two main eventers. I am, I am sad to see Okada and Osprey go. But I don't blame AEW for it. I blame Gato. Yeah. Yeah, uh, the, yeah, I I'm in a similar camp where for me, when it comes to the New Japan AW, um, 
when it comes to AW New Japan relationship, I think obviously Forbidden Door was something that was a concept for me as a wrestling fan. I never thought I'd ever see it in my lifetime. I know they've been yes. partnerships in the past, but just that that show, I mean, that show did wonders for me. And just being able to see like the let's be real. When it came to let's look at the most recent Wrestle Kingdom. When it came to what the main event was of Wrestle Kingdom, the real main event of this Wrestle Kingdom was Okada Danielson. And think about in the Wrestle Kingdom before that, the real main event was Kenny Omega versus Will Ospreay. And all of these things were only possible through the partnership and collaboration. And I think, shameless plug, next week's episode of Commissioner's Corner will be all about New Japan. Like, we are doing a dedicated episode about specifically how the pandemic impacted New Japan. Because as you mentioned earlier, Lyric, we cannot talk about, like, the current state of New Japan without discussing the pandemic. Yes, 100%. Um, because that pandemic absolutely, like, killed a lot of the momentum they built and come and recover from the pandemic. There was a lot of booking practices that Gator put in place that weren't um, benefiting the company long-term. But I think in terms of business we can see the obvious benefit. They take they take a share of, of Forbidden Door. Like you said, the Windy City, Riot, um, Windy City Riot Show is probably their highest gate in the United States. There is merit to the partnership. Um, and Mercedes said in her ESPN interview that came out today that she plans to continue her work through New Japan with New Japan through AEW. So yeah. there's, there's that. Um, New Japan purists are the <laughs> partnership with AEW according to what I've seen on Reddit. Okay. I mean, right. take that up with Gato. Like, that's the thing. Like, I think that this anger is really misdirected because if you can watch this past New Japan Cup and you see evil in the semifinals and you still point AEW as the problem when Shingo Takagi was right there, but AEW is the problem. And the thing is, I think I get so frustrated because everybody, you know, New Japan is having all these problems right now and the product that it isn't the best, but all Japan has a shit ton of management issues right now. And they and they have consistently had the best product in Piro for the past year. Mm -hmm. They came out of all, they went into all together again with Noah and, and New Japan as the most unknown promotion out of the three of them. And they have, and they ended that year as the strongest product with, you know, the best attendance sales out of everybody. There's no excuses. I'm going to be honest. Don't get me wrong. A lot of this sucks, but a lot of this was self-inflicted. Okay. But shout out to Hiroki Goto, though. I am very happy for him. Because And also, he, Goto, if David Finley wasn't injured, that would, that would he would have been in the final. It would have been David Finley. And when it comes to foreigners... Who's getting pushed? It's not Zack Sabre Jr. No. It's not no. Gabe Kidd. No. It's David Finley. Mm -hmm. A lot of this is self-inflicted. Lyric is 100% right. It's, it's Conan. Uh, you know, I've said this before, NK. Conan is the reason why that CMLL partnership is where it is right now. And also, Vikingo vacated his title yesterday. He'll be yeah. all elite soon as well. I always felt that as soon as he dropped that AAA title, he was going to end up in AEW. He's right. injured, though. I think he yeah. resigned he right before his injury, though. He resigned with AAA right before his injury. Really? Oh, I didn't hear that. All right, fine. Yeah, he oh, resigned. Fine. Unfortunately, oh, that was I, a bad move. I was, was like, I was so upset. I said, if you had just held on, brother. Yeah. Just held on. Right. yeah. That's a bad move, but TK gets a lot of things. TNA, yeah. New Japan, it's all unwarranted. Yeah, I definitely think there's a lot of discourse in the comment section right now. The, the, the comment section split. Some people think it's, you know, the partnership is not benefiting New Japan. Some people are. But, if they didn't know, have the partnership, where would New Japan be right now? Clock it. Where would they be right now if they didn't have that forbidden door money, which they receive 50% of? I remember Dave reported they get 50% of that pay per view revenue. That is a lot of money that they probably earn more of that revenue than they do off of the Wrestle Kingdom show every January. That's how big that money is. All right. Where would they be without that money? Where would they be without that relationship? People look at things. I think wrestling fans, uh, and that's one thing I always say, you got to pay attention to all different aspects of pro wrestling business. If you look at stuff on television and you go, oh, this isn't good and they should be doing that, that's one thing. But it's a lot more deeper than that. It, it goes a lot more deeper than that. It's Pro wrestling is a business. 
and it is a lot more than whether or not uh you know evil is holding the world title or whatever it is or you know or sonata being a world champion or whatever excuse me mm. Mm. i think mm. it also like you need how do i say this like that we are we would be having a completely different conversation right now if new japan adequately had prepared for their future Ex absolutely and, but where we are right now is that suddenly you have all these guys who have to become top stars literally overnight and i'm gonna be honest what was okada doing last year six man work which was fantastic but like it wasn't that he was refusing to lay down he wasn't getting booked first of these guys look at the g1 you put all of the young guys in one block together Rather than put them with guys to work experience, of course, of course, having Shingo work Yuya was his best match so far. Of course, that's what happens when you work with experienced talent. And at the end of the day, you had Shota, you got Osprey, essentially give him the match of his life, and then you booked him to lose to get what? Eventually, get David Finley over. And now, guess who is the only person who can really get Shota over now? John Moxley, and you're gonna need him from who? AEW. Lyric NK question: Does Moxley beat Naito next month in Chicago for the world title? I wouldn't be opposed to it. I wouldn't. I, don't, I, I, think I, I, I actually yeah. propose that. Now, I'm I'm fully for that. I think it moves the title off Naito, which right now Naito I don't see him doing much with the title. Um, I think you have a ready-made storyline there with Shota. I don't know if they'll put this title on Shota, but you have a ready-made ready-made storyline. The only issue I would say is obviously John it's just John Moxie appearing for New Japan dates regularly and consistently because Tony, he's a top guy in AW. Tony's gonna want to book him and Tony gonna Tony's gonna have priority on him. But in terms of shaking up the division and having a new face on top and making things interesting, absolutely. And I feel like there's more um, storyline potential with Moxley than there is with like a Naito and someone else, unless you do like a Yoto Suji and Naito match, which which we're going to clear. I think which we're I think yeah. we're going to get anyway. You know, that's the current genesis, and also like to your point, the thing is, let's think about twenty twenty four, right? With with Mox and AEW, right now the Blackpool Combat Club as a whole, their role is like the guardians of the Forbidden Door. Mox hasn't even been on TV in a couple of weeks. And also, he flat out said that he's going to be working more in New Japan dates. And he also said he now has his residency card in Japan. Mm. I don't think that the thing is, especially while you're establishing all of these new people on TV who are going to need more TV time, such as Swerve, who's about to be world champion, Osprey, Okada, Mercedes, the women's division as a whole. Mox taking a step back and not being on AEW TV for a couple months is a 100% a big possibility. And I think it is very realistic for it to happen. And I think that him making his, you know, regular New Japan dates, I don't think that's a stretch. I don't think that's a stretch at all. He flat out said his mission statement was for 2024. He said, expect to see the Blackpool Combat Club in Japan and New Japan specifically a lot more often. And so I don't think the I, I really don't think he goes alone. I think that he takes Claudio with him or something. And I think that that is a part of the new japan trade-off right now of you know we understand that we've gotten some of your big stars and so aw has been very generous with mm -hmm. both moxley and brian danielson recently yes very yes. generous and so i don't think that it's a and you know mox and i said this you know to somebody yesterday your ace and your top star can be the top, the same person, but they don't, they're not always the same person. Mox mm -hmm. is the ace because of his utility. He can be plugged in everywhere. He's already been a three-time world champion. He's not in line for the title right now. He doesn't need to be a guy who's on TV all the time. He's the ace. And right now, what do what does AEW need the ace to do? The ace needs to work and maintain these relationships, these international partnerships. They're yeah. going to Arena Mexico, you know, heading sending him off to Japan. So I I'm for it, especially now that Shingo isn't going uh, didn't win to the New Japan Cup like I wanted. I don't think they have any chance any sadly, I, it doesn't look like they have any intentions of playing the title on Zack Saber Jr. anytime soon. So honestly, I say put it on Mox 
and he's going to make Shota a star. Mm -hmm. um, there was one comment from um, Guap, um, and he said, for argument's sake, is it not better for fans to solely just be fans of the TV aspect as opposed to being in the know? Same way music fans are, are fans of the music, um, not the ins and outs. I mean, the thing is, I mean, yes, maybe for you, but for me, like, especially a person who talks about wrestling on a regular basis, I have to know the ins and outs. You know, mm -hmm. like, I have to know the ins and outs, and the ins and outs is New Japan did not adequately prepare for their future. A lot of their problems are self-inflicted. As a fan, it sucks that Okada is in there. As a fan, it sucks that Osprey isn't there. But anybody who's actually been reading and, like, watching and seeing the signs this was all inevitable. And thank God they got Gabe Kidd to resign. Mm. Thank God that they got him to resign. And they better do something with it. <laughs> they better do something with it. I hear you. I totally hear you. I totally hear you. Um, but yeah, oh, to clarify, he's not talking about wrestling content crazy. He's just talking about fans. But I do think, though, in the I feel like the more fans know in general, I think it's always, even if you're not a content creator, I do think it's interesting to empower yourself with information. Yes. I do feel like, for example, like I'm not somebody who makes film, but I will look into the production of a film. Mm -hmm. Why? Because if I turn out the films, if the film's crappy and I see, hey, there's hella actors are beefing directors backstage, I'm like, that's probably a reason why the film I watched was trash. You know what I'm saying? So I do think, obviously, I don't think any fan is obligated to go online and read dirt sheets. But I do think the more information you do have, the bigger the picture you have. So some of the questions you do have of why is this happening do get answered. And it's like, OK, cool. And now I that question, yeah, go on. I was going to say, especially like as it relates to like the AEW New Japan relationship, you have to empower yourself with the information to know who to like i think a lot of people are misdirecting the blame because they're angry and rightfully so i think a lot of if you are a new japan fan and you're not angry right now about something you're probably not a real new japan fan but i do think that people need to be honest about where a lot of this anger should be directed like because the thing is you would think that and you want to know what's proof of how it's not AEW's fault it's the booking ever since Okada left. The New Japan Cup should have been a complete restart. And yes, you know, like, you know, you kind of got that because it looks like Yoda Suji is going to win. But House of Torture taking up literally all the, the screen time, that's fire to y'all. <laughs> I don't know. I will um I will say this, NK. Um, the way my brain works, right? If I'm interested in something, I need to find out as much information about it as possible, right? So I oh, don't care. Continue, go ahead, knowledge, I'll be back. Yeah, sure. I just want to say that I read books. I've read, you know, I've read the observer for over 20 years now. It's like I am into data, all right. Yeah. So I I'm in a position I'm in a position now where someone messages me on Twitter or asks me in the Discord or in a private message why has this happened or can you give me a story and i can actually tell you why that happens and one of the reasons why i can do that is because i pay attention to the business of pro wrestling yes. and if you do not understand the business of pro wrestling whether that be the current tv rights game or your television ratings or your gate or your pay-per-view buys if you do not understand those areas to some degree you will never have a good understanding of the actual pro wrestling business so if someone will complain about someone not being on television or maybe they'll complain about why so-and-so isn't getting another main event opportunity, I can tell you why. <laughs> and if you followed the pro wrestling business, you will know why yourself. You, no one is obligated to follow pro wrestling to that degree, but you shouldn't knock people for wanting to, is my point. Absolutely. And like I said, like you have every right as a fan to be upset. And I and here's the thing, as a fan, I am upset, but I also like to know, I like to know why things are happening. You know, like it's one thing to just be mad, but it's like I also want to understand why things are happening, or like you know, what, what exactly what am I mad about? Like I like I, I'm one of those people too. Like I'm I'm big on having the knowledge in the language to describe what I'm feeling. Um, so uh, I mean, yeah. 
I'm not knocking people for not wanting to, you know, know. Like, you know, you have no right to know. Yeah, I mean, you have every right to not want to know. But also at the same time, when people call you out about misdirecting your anger, when you get the proper knowledge, you need to understand that, yeah, maybe sometimes you just don't know the answers. You might have chosen not to know the answers, but people also have the right to correct you as well. Yeah, absolutely, oh. man. Absolutely. But um, Lyric, man, this has been an amazing episode. We definitely have to do this again. Um, quick plug, tell the people where they can find you at. And then, like, tell the people what you got going on, man. Um, you can find me at Lyric Wrestling on Twitter and Instagram. And you can subscribe to my YouTube channel, Lyric Swinton, just my first and last name. What do I have coming up? Um, I have a special Women's History Month project that I can't really talk about right now, but it's going to come out in the last week of March. And I'm super excited for people to be able to get into it. And so you can look at all my previous content. I did a Black History Month series of interviews featuring the Ring of Honor Women's World Champion, Athena, um, and a lot of writing and stuff. So super excited. And also I dropped the new episode of Maps and Graps today which is in all japan champion carnival preview for the tournament so if you're looking to get into all japan and want more information feel free um to check it out and for everybody in the comments i know i sound you know i don't want to use the word aggressive but i know i'm very passionate sometimes but it's really nothing personal i just i have strong feelings sometimes about professional wrestling well I wanted to talk about Mark Coleman today, but oh yeah, yeah, let's do that. Let's no, do that. no, 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 it's too late. It's too late. I wanted to talk about Mark Coleman. Sorry. He's a hero, but he rescued his family, his mum and dad, from a burning building last yeah, week. I, heard that. Yeah. I wanted to talk about Mark Coleman and how great of a human being he was, and also to give you some pro wrestling tidbits and pieces about Mark Coleman and his career. But that's that's another time we can do that. I also wanted to talk about the WWE Hall of Fame today as well, but we've run out of time, so it's all good. We'll do that next week, MK. Okay? I wanted to talk about uh, Thunderbolt Patterson. No worries, no worries, no worries. But yeah, man, we appreciate you for coming on. Like I said, we've got a special episode next week, all dedicated to New Japan Pro Wrestling. It will be me, Knowledge, and SP3. Oh, know. yeah. Yeah, my guy, SP3, <laughs> man. My I wanted to talk to SP3 about WCW, though. No, we will. Don't worry. The WCW episode is coming. It's cooking. I wanted to talk about WCW. I wanted to <laughs> rant and rant and rant about Eric Bischoff and Vince Russo for a long time. That was my plan. Three hours. That's what I was thinking. I can't well, wait. Three... Yeah, listen. Look, listen, we're going to get the knowledge um, WCW rant. But make sure, guys, you like, share, comment, and subscribe. Make sure you, know, you become a member. Um, membership gives you access to a bunch of different content, some exclusive content. Speaking of content, we just released Break It Down about The Rock. Break It Down is a series where us and maybe a few guests um, break down the careers of some of the most iconic wrestlers in the world. And we broke down The Rock's promo, The Rock's in-ring ability and his overall legacy on the channel. And tune into our flagship podcast that comes out every single Friday. But yeah, make sure you like, share, comment, and subscribe. This has been Commissioner's Corner. We appreciate Lyric for coming on the show. And we will catch you guys later. See you guys next week. Bye. See ya.